grabbed her phone and hid in the closet. The voices of two men drew closer and stopped outside her door. I think this still scares me so much because it involved my daughter. It's the summer of 2016 and we just purchased a new house. The washer and dryer included with it were brand new. We already had a set, albeit much older. We saw a chance to make a little money and listed them on Craigslist. I hadn't even been aware of the place before my son suggested it. It was surprising to me how fast the call started. We expected it would take the weekend at least before we had a buyer. Several people wanted to pick it up the following morning. Unfortunately, our family was traveling to a reunion and wouldn't be around to let them in. Every caller was told whoever arrived first Monday morning would be the lucky buyer. The terms were set and we headed out the following morning. That night we received a panic call from our daughter. She had stayed behind because of illness. Something truly scary and extraordinary had happened just hours before. She said she was laying in bed, watching TV and heard a loud crash. Then voices echoed from the living room. Not sure what to do, she stayed still and listened. When she was certain it wasn't us, she grabbed her phone and hid in the closet. The voices of two men drew closer and stopped outside her door. They were talking about looking for something. She feared that they were there to kidnap her. The dispatcher kept her calm and they made small talk until the cops arrived. A ruckus could be heard coming from the living room along with some yelling. Then, everything went silent. The dispatcher stopped talking for a moment. Seconds passed, then it was all over. The dispatcher spoke up and told her she could come out. She emerged and introduced herself just as the last thief was being let out. It took a week or two to get the full story. The interrogations uncovered their reason for the break-in. The pair had intended on buying the washer and dryer, at least at first. When I mentioned we'd be out of town, they decided to just break in and take them. Both swore they never knew my daughter was there. I thank my maker they didn't. No telling what could have happened. After first making sure our girl was okay, we returned home that night. I remember shaking like a leaf the whole drive back. I jumped from the car before my husband could park it. The second I saw her, I gave her a big hug and didn't let go for a long time. My husband and I spoke to the police the following morning. They assured us because of their previous convictions the burglars would do prison time. They were still inside the last time I heard and wouldn't be released before 2025. However, with all the cons getting out because of the lockdown, I fear they may be among them. Although our daughter seems to have left it in the past, the long-term effects still aren't clear. If they are released early, I hope any hidden trauma doesn't rear its head and set her recovery back. As for the washer and dryer, a nice young couple picked it up that Monday morning. We happened to run into them a few months ago and they said both units were still working well. I mentioned to them what happened that weekend and they were shocked but still able to find the funny side. I'm glad things went well and we were both able to laugh about it now. Every day we hear of families that weren't so lucky and I'm thankful to not be among them. Hey you guys, it's Rai Horror. It seems like many of you guys enjoy my animated stories, but only 27% of you are subscribed. If you want to see this channel hit 10k subs, then please like and subscribe. Now back to the show. There are two main components to the story. One, I used to make money on the side by selling the loot from storage unit auctions on Craigslist. Two, my brother spent some time in prison for almost killing a guy in a car accident while he was under the influence. Part one of the story takes place while my brother was in prison, and part two is the weekend of his release about six or seven months later. Part one. I bought the keys to this one storage unit that had a whole bunch of cool stuff in it. We're talking a big flat screen LED TV, back when those were still brand new, a laptop computer, and three vintage motorcycles. As you can imagine, I was pretty much over the moon and after I posted the Craigslist ads and the replies started pouring in, I knew I was on track to make a ton of money. The only trouble was I didn't really have any place to keep the bikes, so much to my wife's anger, I kept one in the garage, one in the TV room, and the smaller dirt bike in the hallway of our house. The only thing that kept her off my back was the promise that they'd fetch us a lot of cash. 
and in the advertisement I posted on Craigslist, I promised to knock 20% off the total asking price if someone bought all the bikes together, even more if the offer came fast enough. And what do you know? It seemed to work. I got a call a few days later from a guy who was offering cash for all three bikes. He could also bring his own bike trailer over to transport them away, which really was the answer to my prayers. So, the guy arranges a trailer, then calls me again one evening to confirm my address. I pass on my details, and he says he'll be stopping by in the morning. But during the call, every so often I had to stop giving the address so I could shush my two-year-old who was apparently still discovering just how loud they could yell. So more than once I had to apologize and start over. The guy looking to buy the bikes seemed like a little annoyed. Like the kind of annoyed when you know someone doesn't have kids of their own. But he still said he'd be over in the morning to pick them up. The next morning comes. I've got the bike all ready to go but 10am comes and goes and there's no sign of the buyer. 10.30 a.m. rolls around and there's still no show, so I try giving the guy a call, only to find the phone had been disconnected. He wasn't just ducking me. He didn't try to make an excuse. The phone was just straight up dead. Don't get me wrong, my little Craigslist deals went sideways all the time. People tried to haggle you down at the last minute or simply change their minds, so it wasn't like it was anything out of the ordinary. But a totally disconnected phone line very weird and you can understand why that particular cancel stuck in my mind. Part 2 Like I mentioned previously, about six months after this little incident, my brother gets out of prison. As you can probably guess, it was a real intense time for our whole family, especially since he asked to move into my place until we could find a place to stay long term. I told him if he touched a drop of alcohol, he was out on his butt. But other than that, he could stay as long as he wanted. About two weeks into his stay, I was having a beer out on the porch after the kids had gone to bed when my brother came out to join me. I was a little apprehensive, thinking he might just be trying to get my guard down so he could ask for a beer or something, but I was just being paranoid, and we had a little heart-to-heart -heart that night, me drinking Paps and him drinking Fago. We talked about stuff he'd missed, how mom and dad really felt about his conviction, but most relevant to this story we talked about his time in prison. It was a long, meandering conversation that honestly is a little hazy on my part thanks to the beers, but I remember mentioning something about how I felt bad for him being locked up with all those scumbags. My brother's a jerk, but he's not a bad person. He was torn up after the accident, almost took his own life, and he took his jail time on the chin because he knew he deserved it. I just hated the idea of him being locked up with actual evil people, people that might hurt him, manipulate him, or coach him into being an actual criminal and not just some idiot who liked to drink too much. His reply kind of caught me off guard for a second because instead of telling me some story about talking to murderers or bank robbers, he says something like, there's actually some pretty good guys in there, you'd be surprised. I guess maybe I would, I mean my brother ended up inside. All he made was one dumb but dangerous mistake. But still, I just guffawed and told him to give me one credible example. Then, I swear to God, he starts telling me this story about this biker guy he'd shared a cell with for a few months. He wasn't just any old biker dude either. He was president of the local chapter of quite a well-known one percenter club. Not the kind of guy you want to mess around with, but apparently also a man with a code. He once told my brother a story about how one of his associates found a guy selling a bunch of motorcycles. He planned to get the guy's address, roll up in the middle of the night, kill the guy selling them, then steal the bikes. The only reason they called the job off was because the associate had heard kids on the other end when he was talking to the seller on the phone. It took a minute for the penny to drop but I remember interrupting my brother to ask where they'd seen the bikes advertised, and when he said online, I swear my heart rate went into overdrive for a second. I threw out a flurry of questions, asking him what website, what models the bikes were, where their prospective victims could have been located. My brother didn't have any answers to these questions, 
just a few vague answers before he hit me with a question of his own. I just straight up told him I thought the biker's mark was me, and I told him all about the bikes I'd won in the unit auction, how the buyer seemed to just drop off the face of the earth. To this day I'm convinced it was me, and that the only thing that kept me and my family safe were the whales of my toddler. My brother doesn't seem to think that was the case and insisted that the bikers only targeted other bikers, kind of like the way the mafia only kill and rob other mafia guys, but I'm not so sure. Like I said, even these days I have this feeling in my gut that screams, you dodged a bullet. I was always told that having kids would change my life. They just didn't tell me that it had saved my life at some point too. I used to use Craigslist a whole bunch, and I only ever had one weird or creepy thing happen to me. To this day, I still don't know if it was real or just some elaborate prank, but it definitely left me with a feeling of unease for a few weeks after. So I grew up here in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, and my parents were fresh off the boat from Kazakhstan. I'll give you a minute to make the Borat joke I know you're dying to make, but once it's out of your system... Understand that as Kazakhs growing up in Brighton Beach, I grew up hearing a wide variety of Slavic and Central Asian languages. I knew Kazakh from mom and dad. I learned a lot of Russian due to our neighbors. Heck, we even had a Uzbek landlord who lived on the ground floor, and my dad worked with a guy from Turkmenistan who used to sing me old Turkmen nursery rhymes. Needless to say, when it came to being a broke college student at NYU, and I heard people would pay for translation services on Craigslist, I was desperate enough to post an ad. I was surprised how many people needed translation work done, but it was mostly inquiries stemmed from the Russian to English ad I posted in Russian, and only a handful of emails or calls came from people wanting the reverse. Then, one day I get an email from a random email address asking if I could translate some Russian into English. I replied saying sure and they ended up emailing me two paragraphs of what looked like handwritten letters. I say they were letters but they didn't have any names or addresses attached to them. Maybe there was an address and the guy just didn't show me the envelope or whatever but either way I noticed something was wrong almost right away. First of all the paper was filthy. I could barely make out the lettering but the sender assured me that he'd pay for whatever I could translate. Secondly Although the letters or notes were written in Cyrillic characters, it most definitely wasn't Russian. I told the person it'd take me a few days to get the translation done, making up some lie about being busy with college, but really, I was asking around my neighbors to see if any of them recognized the language. Eventually, a neighbor of mine recognized that the language was Serbian. They didn't speak any Serbian, but they knew enough to recognize it, and more importantly, they knew someone could translate it. I printed out two black and white copies of the photos, the lettering was more pronounced that way, then headed over to this old Serbian guy's apartment on Neptune Avenue. The guy was super friendly at first, inviting me in and offering me tea. I accepted, offering him a little box of bundavara, which are Serbian pastries, in return mainly as a thank you for doing the translation for me. We sit down, he puts on his glasses, I hand him the printouts and he begins to study them. He stops at one point to point out the obvious, very difficult to read, but as he continues his happy little expression fades and he begins to look very, very serious. I'm just sitting there, notebook and pen in hand, ready to jot down what the notes say but the Serbian guy isn't saying anything. I have to actually press him for even just an idea of what the notes said and at that point he just looks up at me and says, I don't know. I think it's something about the war. I assumed the war he was referring to were the series of conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. These were particularly cruel conflicts that often had an ethnic or religious slant to them. So as soon as he said that, I got a particularly bad feeling in my gut. When the guy had finally stopped reading, he looked at me from over his glasses and asked, Where did you get this? I was honest and I told him I had been sent it as part of a small translation business I ran through Craigslist. But who sent this? 
I had to tell him I didn't know. The email address was just a Hotmail account, some non-English word, and some numbers for a username, and it wasn't like I pressed my clients for any personal information. All I was interested in was their PayPal ID. The guy began, shaking his head. I don't like this, he said. This is very bad. Very bad people sent you this, do you understand? At that point, I was so desperate to know what the note said that I was just about ready to strangle him, and in the politest way possible, I asked him to cut the nonsense and tell me what he'd read. I wrote all this down, and it's fragmented, and the translation might not be the best, but here it goes. In a large house found near Bostahovin, all the phone lines have been cut. No other means of communication. Don't believe the commander if he says we're doing fine. We finished off everyone in Fajhar. But everything since then, the situation has been worse and worse. It started after we marched into the hills near Brakovici. During the march, totally disappeared. We sent out a small patrol, but they too stopped answering their radios and we haven't heard from them since. Dragon thinks, afraid, but no one shows it. Found salvation when we came across the house. There were Turks inside and we took them outside. We had to cut off the girl's head to shut her up. The other bodies were still moving when we carried them away and tossed them. So many bullets, more didn't help. We buried them deep, but in the morning the pit had been dug up. They were gone. The Turk fighters here are different. Kolha, they only come at night. It's like they can see in the dark. You must ask a man to send everyone, everyone they can, Kolha, or I'm afraid we won't live to see the dawn. I remember the chill that ran through the air when the guy stopped talking and I suddenly understood why he was so agitated after reading through the notes. I thought he might be able to provide some insight into what he thought was happening to the author, but apart from a brief primer of the Yugoslav civil wars, he couldn't say much. What he did say was that the Turks the author was referring to were most likely, probably Bosnian Muslims as the Serb paramilitaries used Turk as a pejorative for them. But without any information on dates and units, it was almost impossible to discern who wrote the note, and when it was written. However, it's quite clear that it was written to a person named Kolya or Kolha. Maybe a relative of the author or this Kolya person was looking for them years after the war. Maybe they weren't holding out hope of finding a live person either, and maybe one of them had crossed the Atlantic at some point since the early 90s, Hence why it was me that got an email stemming from my Craigslist ad. These were all things that were running through my head at the time, and for the most part, the Serbian guy agreed. But he did have something to add before I left. Many bad things happened during the war, he said. And this too is very bad, but it's also, how you say, proklet. He used a Serbian word but it was one with its roots in the Russian word of the same meaning, so it didn't need any translating. Cursed. I'm not gonna lie. I was definitely freaked out by whatever vague story the notes told, but I just thought it was some small piece, a clue even in some wider, more tragic tale. I just went home, sent the original email or their translation, got paid and went about my business. It wasn't until much later on that I started to really mull over what the notes said, and there was this one week where I basically obsessed over it, trying to interpret meaning, filling in the gaps, and even googling a couple of the places' names. But I think it's that line that reads, bodies were still moving, that sticks with me the most. They talked about decapitating someone, and the body was still moving? I'm not saying anything supernatural was happening, I imagine a headless person is a lot like a headless chicken. But then I start to consider the part where it said, it's like they can see in the dark. And my imagination really starts to run away with me. For quite a while, I'd have done almost anything to know what happened to the person who wrote those notes. But I think I'd be better off not knowing.